Today's session will focus on arbitrators training. We will be kicking off with the panel discussion on pre-appointment checks and disclosures, accepting an appointment as an arbitrator, running an efficient arbitration, managing parties in council and working effectively with fellow arbitrators. The panelists for this segment are Honorable Justice A.K. Sikri, former judge of the Supreme Court of, in India, of India and international judge at the Singapore International Commercial Court. Professor Benjamin Hughes, arbitrator at the Arbitration Chambers. Dr. Michael Huang, senior counsel and chartered arbitrator at Michael Huang Chambers, LLC. Mr. Philip J. Ratnam, senior counsel, global vice chair and RCR CEO at Denton's Rodrick and Davidson LLP. And lastly, Mr. Sikhu Mukhopadhyay, Senior Advocate at the Supreme Court of India. Modering, moderating this session is our member of the court, Mr. Darius Kambata, Senior Counsel. Mr. Kambata, please, over to you. Thank you, Shweta, and good morning to you all. Uh, we have a very interesting session ahead of us. Uh, I'm privileged, actually, to be moderating this session because uh, we have a galaxy, a veritable galaxy of stars, uh, international judges, professors, leading arbitrators and counsel on this panel. Uh, the importance of having a panel like this and the sort of topics we are going to discuss is, is this. It's, it's well known that one minute of actual experience is worth 10 pages of text. And that's what we're hoping to give you in this session because all the people on the panel are going to share with you their personal experiences, their personal perspectives, and a whole lot of things which I'm sure you won't find in any textbook, not even in Gary Bond's absolute classic on arbitration. Uh, I have one advantage and also one disclaimer uh, to be moderating this panel. I'm perhaps the only one on the panel who's never acted as arbitrator. And so I hope to give you a slightly different perspective and draw out these distinguished arbitrators and judges on, on various topics. So without much further ado, let's get straight on uh, to the topics at hand. Uh, you might have noticed that they've been divided up under certain sections. So we're going to start with the very beginning of an arbitration. How does it all start? How does an arbitrator get drawn into an arbitration? And what happens at the beginning? So that's the area of pre-appointment interviews. Now, these have been quite controversial. And I know that there are cultural differences also, which we have to take into account. For example, the extent of a pre-appointment interview in, in a country like India is far less than you would expect in international arbitration. In fact, it's almost seen as something improper to be asking too many questions of the person you want to nominate as arbitrator. On the other hand, uh, in international practice, uh, you may be hauled up for negligence if you don't ask those questions. So uh, this is the balance that has to be struck when we participate in international arbitrations. And, and let me kick off with uh, the judge on the panel, Justice Sikri. Uh, Justice Sikri is, of course, recently retired from the Indian Supreme Court and also sits on the Singapore International Commercial Court. So I really want to know from him, uh, if someone calls him up, and ask him to whether he'd be agreeable to be nominated as arbitrator. What are his first reactions? What questions does he ask? Uh, and what questions does he expect to be asked of him? Judge? Thank you, Darius. And uh, for your, uh, I should say, very liberal comments on all the panelists we are beholden for that, uh, and I hope that uh, the uh, audience or the participants are going to learn something from our experience. We'll like to share whatever we can. Now, uh, coming to your question, actually, uh, in my position, the situation here is uh, quite different, which I have experienced up to now. As you rightly said, first of all, in India, normally such uh, interviews don't happen. Uh, up to now, in all the cases in which I have been appointed as an arbitrator, whether it is a sole arbitration or I have been nominated uh, by one of the parties as an arbitrator, or I have been appointed as the presiding arbitrator by the two other arbitrators, 
no such uh, 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 pre appointment interview has taken place normally what happens is that uh, the person calling uh, if if it is going to be a sole arbitration uh, anybody who has called me uh, would say that yes on, on behalf of one party that uh, uh, he or she has the consent of the other party and on that basis they are speaking or sometimes they speak jointly also which should be in a case uh, when you are going to be appointed a sole arbitrator and uh, what is what they normally ask is about the conflict of interest that these are the parties two parties uh, and uh, and this kind of uh, they, they they may say in one or two minutes the subject matter of dispute etc so whether there is any conflict or not so that has happened up to now in fact uh, uh, as i said in none of the cases any interview has taken place and interestingly uh, I, i tell you within uh, maybe couple of uh, months uh, uh, after my retirement uh, when i was in a ciac arbitration only appointed as presiding arbitrator by the other two arbitrators they said and that may be the advantage of working as a judge for 20 years so this was an the issue involved was uh, of uh, uh, see uh, it related to intellectual property so they thought because of my judgments that i have good knowledge about it so they didn't, didn't ask me they didn't interview the two arbitrators also they said they they are, these arbitrators were from different jurisdictions one was uh, queens council in uk other was uh, in uh, singapore so they said that we have seen your judgments etc we know you have some expertise in this so only conflict of interest uh, situations so no pre uh, interview uh, i mean uh, appointment interview in other case again it was uh, which is again a ciac matter uh, which i am doing and uh, where i was nominated as an arbitrator for, from one of the parties so they again said again no interview they said that the matter relates to the tax issue uh, 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 tax law in india and uh, going by uh, 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 your your expertise in that so we are nominating you so up to now my experience has been of this nature as i know otherwise uh in other countries as you rightly said it has become not only a phenomena and normally it is now widely accepted that there should be pre uh, uh, appointment interviews also so uh, as was my experience guys and i'll say this much thank you thank you for giving us the perspective uh, from india and, and from your perspective and i want i want to switch straight away to mr michael wang uh, who as we know has been chief justice of the dubai international financial center court for i think almost 8 years and a very distinguished arbitrator as well uh, michael what's your experience been on pre appointment uh, interviews i think in the early days when i was not so well known um i had uh, some queries uh, or requests for interviews um in but you know going back into my memory i can only remember uh the one serious interview i had uh and this was a case uh of quite large importance uh and the lawyer said he needed to bring his client uh, who didn't know me at all uh to just have a meeting uh so i consulted my seniors at the time and said what is the form because at that time there were no guidelines uh no written guidelines and the chartered institute had not yet issued uh, its practice direction which it has now and siac rules did not have uh, any specific guidance on this matter so based on what i had called from a couple of uh, more experienced arbitrators uh, i told uh, the party uh, if you want to have this pre appointment interview uh, i will agree i just have four conditions and these are the conditions that i still Uh, apply with some variations first the uh, prospective party or, or the party who wants to uh, in, uh, interview me and his lawyer if he wants to bring the lawyer uh comes to my office i don't go to his office all right that establishes i think a proper relationship uh second i will confine the interview time to 45 minutes some people say half an hour some people say an hour i think 45 minutes is enough uh to satisfy them but not too uh, long to encourage them straying outside the boundaries uh the third uh and most valuable uh, advice i got is 
have someone else present. Ideally, you actually have a lawyer from an independent firm. So it's a completely independent witness to sit and take notes. But not many people would spare you the time of day to do this uh, unless it's a very good friend. So usually I just get uh, a junior from my office uh, to sit with me and then he or she will take notes, uh, quite detailed notes, which will be typed up afterwards. So we have a record uh, which is contemporaneous and can be shown if any questions are asked later. And the fourth condition, uh, which is the most important one, is we do not discuss anything about the merits of the case. Uh, what is the proper subject matter in this kind of an interview is uh, for them to find out whether in their view, uh, I have the necessary qualifications and perhaps temperament uh, to handle this kind of a case. So uh, thankfully now that the Chartered Institute has uh, given its guidelines, um, and also SIEC has uh, given guidelines, uh, we can discuss things like my qualifications, uh, my availability, uh, whether or not I have specialist experience in the uh, issues that will be heard in this particular case, sometimes language skills, if there is some foreign witnesses, usually of course, Chinese witnesses, uh, and perhaps some tentative discussions about uh, what kind of a person is the co-arbitrator if that person has been appointed uh, and what kind of person that we might look at for the chair. Now that is a very important uh, point because that is actually specifically permitted by most rules that you can have discussions with a party about what kind of a person should be chosen as a chair. And the lawyer may explain to you, look, this case involves certain features. We have uh, nationality issues, we have language issues, we have uh, te uh, technical expertise issues, uh, and we want to be sure that you have these in mind when you and your co-arbitrator eventually have to select uh, the chair. So those are the sort of basic ground rules that I operate by. But it hasn't happened for a very long time. Most often, it's just a lawyer whom I know, or maybe sometimes I don't know, and they pick up the phone and they know the rules. And so we chat and we just talk about you know, these things. You're right, Michael. That That's probably the most common way of doing things, but it's it's important to know uh, the rules and, and the goalposts really uh, for a more a, a more detailed approach if it, if it ever happens to occur. And I'm glad you mentioned the fact that the first thing you insist on is that they must interview you in your office. I think that certainly sets the marker right from the beginning. Uh, and th that is that is not a matter just of form. I think it's a matter of substance as well. Uh, so what about you, Philip? How, how do you approach this? Any well, thoughts? Um, certainly. Uh, well, from my, from my experience, uh, I, I have never asked as an advocate, I've never asked for a pre-appointment interview with an arbitrator, um, principally because I, I think um, one should know enough about arbitrators uh, from, um, you know, from I, either from your own knowledge of them or from asking others who have appeared before them. And even if someone is, is, uh, uh, um, is, is located far away from Singapore and uh, you, you would still have that opportunity to, to ask colleagues uh, or friends in, in that jurisdiction about the arbitrator. So I, I've never done it myself. And I, 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 although I do uh, um, note uh, Michael's point, which is, uh, it, it is, I think, important that when there is selection of a presiding arbitrator, uh, one would expect a party nominated arbitrator to at least um, have some conferral with, uh, with, with the advocate who has appointed them about a possible list of names uh, in general terms. So um, that would be the exception. And I, I have been involved in that. I, I, I do think there's an interesting question here, which is the extent to which one should keep, uh, uh, one should disclose having uh, actually done these interviews if one is an arbitrator. Uh, and if one discloses, you know, the extent of that disclosure, should one have kept notes and would those notes be disclosed? Um, I, I uh, have not seen disclosure happen. But uh, I notice uh, it, it is, of course, uh, mentioned in, in the CIR uh, uh, guidelines. So that's an open question for me. 
That's right. That, that's, but what, would your approach be any different if you had to nominate an arbitrator and if you were selecting one? Oh, okay. I, actually, I've been talking. So, so you're, you're asking me again? Yes. Yes, um, I, am. I am. Sorry, yes, Philip. Yeah. Sorry, sorry. Um, uh, I, I actually, my, I was talking about my experience uh, as somebody nominating uh, a, a, an arbitrator. Right. Um, I, I have sat as arbitrator, and in, in my experience as an arbitrator, nobody's asked me for a uh, for, for a pre-appointment. I'm sure not. I'm sure not. Yeah. That's good. And Ben, any ideas? Ben, Siku, any, any ideas? Thoughts? Um, I don't have much to add except to say that um, for those concerned about the potential um, issues that may arise in connection with inappropriate interviews, um, they are exceedingly rare, as both uh, Michael and Philip have alluded to. I think I've been interviewed twice in my entire career, less than 1% of the cases that I've been appointed in. And in both cases, um, the, the questions were very forthright. Conflicts, availability, uh, experience in this sector, um, and uh, experience or knowledge of the co-arbitrator who had already been appointed in one case. So. Um, I think people are aware of, of the rules. The, 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 the big red flag is you simply cannot discuss the merits of the case. And I, if I am going to be interviewed, I make it very clear in advance that I will be keeping a record, I will be making a disclosure, and we will not be discussing the merits of the case. Right. Uh, and I speaking, yeah, I speaking for myself, I'll just talk about my experience. I think everybody else has mentioned the entire gamut of what happens in a be appointment interview. Um, the only difference that I found recently among you know the Indian councils or Indian law firms who ask uh, before appointment, apart from the normal conflict and the normal availability thing, is that are you willing to discuss uh, the aspects of the potential chair? So I'm talking from a purely Indian perspective that the the kind of things that are developing here. This is the one additional um, sort of element that has come into the pre-appointment process. They've never asked questions about um, experience or you know any other matter, but just this, these are the only three things they ask nowadays that I've found. You're right. This is exactly what everybody said. In India, actually, in the old days, we never really engaged with our, with your nominated arbitrator for appointment of the chair, but that is really par for the course, isn't it, internationally? Uh, yeah, and, 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 and both ways. You're entitled, no, and while we have you, Siku, can we go straight into conflicts? Because uh, as an active council, uh, and a very, very, very busy one, and, and we know how busy you are, uh, how do you manage your conflicts checks? I think it's much easier now than earlier when I was a partner in a law firm. And now as a senior counsel, it's become much easier to, because you know I know the clients that I've been representing as counsel, um, so at least when anybody approaches, that's a very easy thing to check whether I've ever represented them. The very often cases where, you know, in fact, I've had nominations or sort of requests uh, from ICC or SIAC where yeah, I've appeared for both sides. So both sides have been my clients and, and ongoing sometimes that have been, you know, appearing either for one or the other or against one or the, you know, appearing for one. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I think a number of arbitrations have to be shot down by people like us who are both arbitrators and uh, practitioners in that sense, you know, as counsel. The, two, the other difficulty I find uh, that we constantly have is that often you get appointed or you get a, a request for an appointment for an arbitrator and you find that you're actually appearing as counsel before that, you know, that arbitrator or vice versa. You get a core, I mean, right now, I mean, Right now, I have three matters exactly like this, where I'm appearing as counsel before an arbitrator. I'm sitting as a co-arbitrator with one of those arbit with the chair. Um, there's somebody who's appearing as a counsel before me, and right now we're in the process of, you know, being appointed as co-arbitrators in, in in another matter. And this uh, comes to disclosures straight away as to, you know, how do you deal with disclosures? And my view has always been, it's, um, you know, that you should disclose straight away before you accept the appointment. Uh, tell the other side that you've been approached as counsel. And that's what I did in the other matter, with the, which uh, tell the other side that, look, you've been approached to act as counsel in a matter where I'm already sitting as a co-arbitrator with the chair in, in, you know, who's also the chair in the other matter. And would they have an objection? 
and uh, Harish was on the other side in that one, and he straight away said, so, no way that I'm going to object to something like this, so you can act as counsel, there's no problem. Um, so it all depends, of course, in these kind of situations, and that's been my experience, that largely people don't object as long as you disclose straight away. This is not, um, you don't want a situation where this comes out later, and then that's a problem. That's true. I think disclosure cures it all, Siko, because in a manner of speaking, and you again have a tremendous experience, particularly of international arbitration, it probably adds to the integrity of the process. If you have been counsel in one, in one scenario before a particular arbitrator, and then you are a co-arbitrator with him, uh, because you, you, you know uh, you're, you're that much more careful about crossing any line uh, in, in that sense. So in, in a sense, the integrity of the process improves, as it were, with this intermingling of roles. That's, what do you think? Uh, absolutely, I would agree with that. And I think it makes you also more careful uh, in the way you present, like as a counsel, when you're appearing before that um, person whom you're acting, you're with, uh, you're sort of at the same time a co-arbitrator with. When you're appearing as counsel, you're much more careful in the way you present your case. Um, in the same way, and when you're a co-arbitrator with him, I think you, you make sure that there's absolutely no sort of in, uh, exchange on, on the other aspects which, you know, where you're counsel. So these are things which automatically come to you. And I think, um, obviously, it is totally necessary that you maintain that distance uh, when, and, and right. I found that all international arbitrators do that at, you know, at a very, very high integrity level. Justice Sikri, what has your experience been uh, in terms of conflicts? Because as a retired judge, not only have you heard so many matters during your career, perhaps involving the same parties, perhaps the same issues, but you're also now very busy with giving written opinions or even oral opinions. Uh, do you find that that affects your disclosures or your situation as to conflicts in any way? Yeah, Darius, you're very right there. I think as far as I'm concerned as a judge, uh, the kind of, uh, I mean, uh, situations I'm confronted with. Uh, you see, before that, I come to the three or four uh, things which are in my mind. Uh, I have always kept in mind the two cherished words in so far as conflict is concerned, impartiality and independence. So I have to look into the matter from this, whether this particular circumstance or situation is going to affect either my impartiality or my independence. If that is happening, naturally, I have to say no. Now, uh, in my situation, there are two, uh, three or four uh, types of situations which come uh, uh, along. One is that, uh, you see, my son is a lawyer. So I have to ensure that he is not the lawyer of that particular party, which, uh, uh, I mean, uh, is one of the parties to that particular litigation, that arbitration matter. So therefore, normally, I, 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 I know and uh, on that basis, so that would be my first check. And uh, uh, like I give you an example in one case, because it's not that I have to talk to him every now and then that look this. Uh, matter I am approached whether I should accept or not that generally doesn't happen because he is in own word I am in my own word so we are working independently but sometimes we interact particularly when the matters are important of important nature as uh, it happened in one of the cases that where I had uh, although after my acceptance so we didn't know my son came to know and he said that he had in that particular case for that particular client was engaged in one matter for one particular date, but he could not appear also. And that too happened about five years ago. But then on coming to know immediately, I gave that disclosure and told the parties that yet yeah, whether you have any objections. So this was his role. So when the other parties, they said, no, we can go ahead. Now, other thing which you have rightly said is as a now, uh, uh, we may have decided the issue on that particular issue which is involved in that case uh, as a judge and given that judgment. But in that case, I have seen that that has never come in the way and that doesn't uh, uh, become a conflict situation. More important that is when we talk of issue bias and particularly uh, in international arbitrations is the opinion. You are very right because uh, I have been uh, inundated with that work after my uh, this thing uh, 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 retirement and uh, there are people who are coming to me. So this this situation can arise in two three manners. Number one, the uh, the, the arbitration which has come where one of the parties is involved may have uh, asked 
not in that particular case, not on that particular issue, also on altogether different issue, they may have asked for some opinion from me about six months ago or one year ago. But then that is the situation again, uh, if we go by our Indian uh, Arbitration Act, that if I'm not a legal advisor in that sense, and I have not given uh, any opinion on that particular issue, it doesn't uh, uh, create a situation of conflict, but yes, it needs to be disclosed. So that disclosure I make, and up to now, I find that uh, nobody has uh, ever objected to that on that basis. But that even before accepting the appointment, I make that uh, uh, disclosure. Another situation is sometimes because uh, when you are getting, uh, uh, I mean, a good number of uh, arbitrations, sometimes it happens that suppose in one, uh, uh, there are more than one cases where uh, a particular party is involved, let's say A versus B, uh, you are a presiding arbitrator, then A versus C, you are again a presiding arbitrator. So A is a party which is common there. So again, that disclosure, I normally make that look in one case, I was appointed as presiding arbitrator, but two or, but when it comes to nomination, then you have to, because if I'm nominated by that particular party, then I may say even no uh, in the other case, unless it is a matter of uh, presiding arbitrator. In that case, I make the disclosure. So therefore, these are some of the aspects which uh, I keep in mind while uh, 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 doing this check of uh, conflict of interest. So, so let me give you an, in, uh, an interesting anecdote. Uh, and, and the question really will be is how, how strongly do your previous opinions influence you when you're deciding a matter, whether in court or in arbitration? So there was this famous story of uh, C.K. Daftari, who was uh, Solicitor General of India, and he was one of the greatest, perhaps the greatest advocate we've ever known. And he was appearing in the Supreme Court before Chief Justice J.C. Shah. Uh, and he knew that on that very issue, Justice J.C. Shah had delivered a judgment while sitting as a judge of the Bombay High Court, which was dead against the view that Daftari was expounding. So uh, when this was raised... Uh, and in fact, Justice Shah told him, Mr. Daftari, I've already taken a view on this. That's when Daftari came up with his brilliant repartee. He says, yes, my lord, but it is always open to my lord to repent. Yeah. So I tell you, uh, 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 in the same way, another anecdote, which is very interesting. And that is why maybe we judges after retirement also, even if we have given that opinion, the parties don't uh, object to that. Uh, before Justice Kapoor in the Supreme Court, one, uh, when he was judge of Delhi High Court, so one judgment which he had delivered as judge of Delhi High Court was cited by uh, one of the parties, saying that, look, your lordship has decided, and he was very happy that this uh, judge has taken this particular view, so uh, he will affirm that in Supreme Court also, and that, oh, it's a very good judgment in my support, so he cited that judgment. And the here, the judge, in that case, uh, what we have said, Mr. Daftari uh, made the remark, in this case, the judge says, oh, bring that judgment to me. I, ever since I gave that judgment, I was uh, looking for an opportunity to overrule myself because I thought that I decided wrongly. So now I have got an opportunity sitting in the Supreme Court, I will overrule my own judgment. So therefore, that kind of impartiality is expected of the judges. And that is one goodwill which we carry. <laughs> that, that's nice to hear. That's, that's really re heartening to hear. Ben, what's your view? I mean, you've heard the other speakers uh, err on the side of disclosure. But is there such a thing as over-disclosure? I mean, could, could that make an arbitrator vulnerable to objections? What's your view? Uh, yes, I think that is a danger. I mean, I, I, I have it easier, I think, than some of the other members of this panel because I only sit as an arbitrator. So it's very easy for me to check conflicts, as, uh, as Chico was saying earlier. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, but um, I think you have to look at independence and impartiality, not only um, asking yourself, am I independent and impartial, but would the parties standing in their shoes and both sides um, have any reasonable grounds to suspect that I might not be independent or impartial? It's the appearance sometimes, uh, which is the reality when we're talking about conflicts. Um, so there's a tendency, I think, for many of us to be cautious and to, to disclose things that we think might uh, cause the parties to have some reasonable doubt as to our independence and impartiality, as the other panelists have mentioned. And I think all of those things they've mentioned, I would disclose. I, I fully agree, and I tend to be a bit 
uh, of, a, of a disclosure, over disclosure in that regard. But there are many things that are simply not worth disclosing and, and can result in frivolous challenges that simply waste everyone's time. Um, you know, I've seen an arbitrator, a co-arbitrator in one of my cases disclose that they spoke on a panel like this together with uh, counsel from one side uh, several years in the past. Uh, I've seen an arbitrator disclose that they were a uh, LinkedIn connection with a counsel or with a co-arbitrator. And, you know, these kinds of things are expected. They're professional um, networking and, you know, activity within the arbitration community is naturally going to happen. And I think over disclosure of these kinds of incidental professional con uh, contacts will uh, potentially lead to frivolous challenges. And they're not always with bad intentions. Sometimes it's simply a misunderstanding of what those contacts mean uh, in, in the context of our uh, international arbitration community. I've been challenged once on the basis of a LinkedIn connection. And it was a connection to a, an in-house counsel in an affiliated company of one of the parties. And when I went back, I didn't even realize I was connected. And when I went back to look, I found that the lawyer who was raising the challenge was also connected to me on LinkedIn. Uh, and so, you know, these kind of things are, are silly in a way, but they, they can cost time and money. And so I think we should be cautious not to overdisclose because of the, it, it won't necessarily result in a successful challenge, but even an unsuccessful challenge can cost time and money for the parties. You're right, it can be damaging. Uh, uh, Michael, what's your view, uh, particularly in, in, in investment treaty arbitrations, where as you know, the awards are published. If, if views have been taken by an arbitrator in the past, uh, is, that, is that just something that should be disclosed or, should he, or would he in any way uh, be required to step aside and, and refuse uh, nomination as an arbitrator if the, if the identical issue comes up? Interesting question, because there is um, a slight conflict between the uh, guidelines on this topic. Now, and this problem actually comes up much more in investment treaty arbitration uh, than in commercial arbitration. So it's much less of a problem uh, as to issue conflict for practical reasons, mainly of lack of uh, the, uh, availability of uh, arbitration awards uh, so that people don't really know how a particular arbitrator uh, thinks uh, or has decided in the past. Whereas, as you say, investment treaty uh, awards have a much larger proportion of publication. Uh, and secondly, also, uh, a lot of the uh, investment treaty arbitrators uh, are academics. And academics, of course, have written articles uh, on related topics, sometimes on the very topic itself, which may well have been one of the reasons why um, he or she which was chosen. Um, but if you look at the uh, IBA guidelines, now there's a thing called the green list and the green list list situations where you do not have to make disclosure. And the, uh, one of the things on the green list in a rather prominent position is that if an arbitrator has previously uh, expressed an opinion in some publication uh, on an issue, uh, that is not necessary to be disclosed. Uh, but the green list is one of the parts of the uh, uh, IBA guidelines, uh, which have been uh, more strongly uh, criticized. And uh, I mean, in my view, it's very difficult to create a green list which says, if you have this fact situation, you don't have to disclose because it all depends on the situation. And sometimes these factors are, do not stand by themselves, but combined with other factors uh, would make a case for uh, at least disclosure, if not objection. Um, but coming back to the particular case, I wrote an article about issue conflict and exit. Uh, and so this particular topic has a lot of case law. And one of the most famous ones is a case called UBASA, U-R-B-A-S-E-R. And the, uh, one of the arbitrators, a very distinguished arbitrator called Campbell McLaughlin from New Zealand was challenged 
on the ground that a particular case uh, in investment treaty law uh, was central to the issues in the present case. And Campbell had written a book uh, together with two other prominent arbitrators, which many of us actually use uh, as a guidebook, as a, as a textbook for, for practical purposes. And in that, uh, the textbook expresses quite strong views about this particular case. Uh, I think it's called the Mahfazzini case. And, you know, they said, well, he's already made up his mind. So we can't have him as an arbitrator. Now in the exit procedure, you challenge to the other two uh, co-arbitrators and the other two co-arbitrators then delivered uh, a, an opinion. And they said, no, uh, by itself, uh, an opinion, a, an academic opinion by itself should not disqualify. A, because an opinion is an op a legal opinion is a legal opinion, but you have to see that legal view in the context of the facts of this particular case. And because the, the uh, arbitrator has expressed a view on the academic side of things, it uh, doesn't mean to say he's going to de decide in favor of the party you know, who's pushing the particular legal viewpoint. Uh, and, and secondly, and in my view, uh, a little bit tongue in cheek, they says, well, academics uh, are supposed to be uh, true to principles of academic research and be independent in their thinking. Uh, and if you make a good case uh, for the contrary legal view, I'm sure uh, the arbitrator is capable of changing his mind. Okay, so I think that's a sort of a viewpoint that is out there for discussion or for reflection. That's right. So, um, yes, sorry, I'm interested. Yes, yeah, let me give another uh, very interesting example. I was confronted with one this anecdote, uh, and which is really where, although such situation may not happen. Uh, 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 I mean, uh, routinely, but this is what happened. In one case, which was a dispute, one arbit so one of the parties say they nominated A, other party nominated B, and both of them nominated C as the chair. Now these three persons were doing, uh, I mean, going ahead with the arbitration. So it was relating to some, some payments of commission, etc., to be made on sales, uh, and uh, say four or five quarters, quarterly payments were to be made. So issue was raised. Since it was a recurring thing, relationship continued. Then for next four or five quarters, when the dispute arose and uh, the claimant again nominated same A, but uh, insofar as the respondent is concerned for whatever reason, although the issue are going to be, were going to be identical, nominated D instead of B, and uh, the two A and D, they nominated me as the presiding arbitrator. Now, we started with this. Of, of course, as far as nomination of A is concerned, both the parties knew that he is nominee arbitrator in the first arbitration also. And issues are also common. And uh, this was disclosed still in the first hearing itself. And it was also recorded that parties have no objection for his continuing. Now, as it happened, the earlier arbitration started much earlier. So the award was given in the meantime. Now the award went against the respondent. Claim was awarded. Now respondent now moves an application in the second case that look, this issue has already been decided. And uh, A uh, was the arbitrator, his arbitrator here also. So therefore his view is already there. So it would be, uh, uh, I mean, uh, in, uh, a, a partial view in the second case. So therefore he should now recuse himself. So application was filed in that. Although now it was a very interesting situation that on the one hand, he is right that he has already taken a view on identical between the same parties. On the other hand, uh, it was a disclosure was made and the parties had accepted. So, but what was, what we did was we rejected the application of on the ground that the disclosure was made and the parties knew that the first case is going to be decided one way or the other. But just in order to maintain the sanctity of the second arbitration, after this order was passed, that arbitrator recused himself of his own and another arbitrator was appointed. That, that's, that's really interesting. Uh, yeah. These are the situations one has to encounter, I suppose, uh, in, in, in real life when you're actually arbitrating and uh, it's something a book can never tell you about. But uh, Philip, coming to you, uh, as a, a practicing and a very busy practicing lawyer, as well as an arbitrator, how do you handle conflicts? And, and would it bother you that you've taken a view either at a seminar 
or in a webinar or in an article uh, which was somewhat contrary to the view that uh, your client was taking when you were arguing a matter in arbitration. Well, in, in answer to, to that last bit of your question, um, I, I think I'm, I'm well known for uh, taking uh, all the different sides of any issue uh, at different points in time. So uh, I, I, I wouldn't be too troubled uh, uh, about that. I think uh, sitting as an arbitrator, obviously you, 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 you listen to the arguments in the context of the facts and, and decide on that basis. Um, I, I, I think uh, for the earlier part of your question, um, the, the, the point which um, I, I face and, and um, have tried in the past uh, to use um, advanced disclosures to deal with is, is this. I mean, obviously in a very large firm, particularly one with multiple offices uh, across the world, um, any large company that is arbitrating in front of you has affiliates all over the world, which will be uh, from time to time in the course of a two or three year arbitration approaching uh, a firm like ours and uh, and and doing uh, uh, engaging uh, perhaps you know the Kazakhstan office or the London office or whatever it is uh, on a matter which is absolutely nothing to do with the arbitration um, and so that's something which I, I, I have uh, uh, put in as sort of an advance uh, 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 disclosure um, and I, I, I uh, it, it is something which under the IBA, uh, uh, rules, I think, is is uh, not guaranteed to work, but it's sort of a, an open question as to whether it would uh, whether it would work. I also, uh, when such uh, in, uh, engagements happen somewhere else, I will disclose it. Um, but I, I'm always concerned at that point in time whether a party that thinks they're losing uh, might then try and use that fresh disclosure of something which has already been kind of disclosed in general in advance and really has nothing to do with this case may then uh, uh, raise that as a, as, as a potential uh, disqualifying conflict. Um, and and I, I suppose just one more point to make. I, I, I think that um, it, it, it's very important uh, for counsel not to make frivolous uh, allegations of conflict. I think that's really a professional duty, at least in, in, in our two jurisdictions, in India and in Singapore, for sure, uh, not to make frivolous uh, uh, complaints or, or allegations. Um, and I, I, I think the difficulty is more often with clients. I mean, clients can be very suspicious and they hear something about uh, whatever it is being a LinkedIn contact or uh, 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 speaking together at a seminar. And then the client's mind starts uh, exactly. uh, working on that. And so I think that's often a source of challenges rather than uh, the council themselves. I think that's a very good point you make, Philip, actually. A, a lot of this is generated and, and uh, fueled by, by clients' uh, uncertainties and, and mistrust. And it's, it's the role of us council to ensure that you explain to your client that this is just going beyond the line. There's no question of raising these issues. Uh, that's, that's really very important. Uh, Philip, let, let's move on to the next topic because ultimately disclosure and conflicts is a matter of the arbitrator deciding whether it's going to affect his impartiality or independence. And that's really a facet of the fairness of the whole process. Uh, fairness and procedure. How do you approach that as an arbitrator? Do you think that it's a matter of dealing with circumstances as they arise, or do you think a good procedural order number one can, can solve many of the problems in advance? I, I, I certainly uh, think that um, a, a good procedural order um, number one is, is very important, but I also think it's very important that that should be um, uh, finalized uh, very much uh, in a uh, you know, face to face, if by Zoom or otherwise uh, meeting, I think that's that th th that is very important. Uh, it, I, I have noticed that um, uh, the use of, um, I suppose, standard PO ones uh, from different arbitrators, uh, it's it, it's it's helpful. 
but without uh, some really detailed consideration of it, which then can raise questions because sometimes council may have uh, a, a different interpretations uh, and, and you know, all, all sorts of things. I mean, for example, what degree of witness preparation should be allowed, um, things like that, which may not directly arise in a standard uh, PO1, but through a process of talking through that, uh, that, that PO may, uh, may, may then be ventilated. And I, I, I think it's so important that uh, both council uh, understand and are operating on sort of the same uh, bases uh, within the same parameters. Uh, thank, thank you, Phil. Ben, how democratic are you as an arbitrator when it comes to the drafting of the first procedural order? Do you, do you ask for proposals from council or do you just impose your own template on them? Well, I, I, I endorse everything that uh, Philip just said. I think, I think involving the parties in the, in the drafting of this procedural order number one, which sets out how we're going to proceed throughout the arbitration, is very important for um, getting the parties buy-in to the process, uh, engendering trust, and, and letting the parties feel like they have a real say in how this process is going to be um, conducted. And so um, it, it, I do have a template that I, I can make available to the parties, uh, but you know this is very much on a case-by-case -case basis. If I am appointed as the chair or sole arbitrator in a case with experienced counsel, for example, my practice is to ask them, uh, look, you both know how arbitration works. You may have specific uh, concerns that you want to address in the procedural order. I'm happy for the parties to confer and come up with a procedural order that suits the parties and then submit it to me. I'm not entirely bound by that, of course. I mean, if there's something in there that just doesn't seem like it's going to work, I might want to discuss that with the parties. But you know, let, let them uh, come up with a template that we can work with. Um, I always offer, uh, if if you'd like uh, to work from the template that I have, I'm happy to send that to you as well. And often they they prefer to take me up on that offer. Um, but it really gives them the first crack at setting out the procedure for the arbitration, uh, gets a buy-in of the parties, and then we have a face-to-face -face meeting to finalize everything. Um, in, in cases where I think the parties may be less experienced, I may be more inclined to suggest that they work from my uh, template. But again, I make very clear to them that this is not, uh, this is a draft that I am seeking. I'm, I'm actively seeking their input and comments and that we will finalize it um, to the extent possible together on the case management uh, conference call. Uh, before I issue the, the procedure. That's right. So you really, you really want to carry the parties and their counsel with you, at least at that stage of the arbitration. That's very important for ensuring fairness throughout the arbitration, I think. Yes. Uh, Michael, do you have any views on this? I know you have a template, procedural order number one. You're on mute, Michael. Yeah, that's right. You're on mute. Apologies. Uh, my template for procedural order number one is rather long, uh, but I always send it out to the parties if I am chair or sole arbitrator and let the parties, um, you know, come back to me with their comments. So I say that this is just a working draft. Um, and the, the reaction sometimes is, you know, why do we need particular clauses? And I say, well, this is the product of experience. You think that some people cannot get certain some things wrong, but they do. And when they do get things wrong, I don't want that to happen again. So uh, they, some of them say, well, we'll never do this. I said, well, somebody else has done it. So, you know, I just can't tell. Uh, and I try and make it easy for them to read because of the slang. So I highlight the places where they actually need to sit down and fill in the blanks because obviously a template would have blanks particularly dates of filings and so on. Uh, and I also highlight particular clauses which they may not be used to seeing. Uh, and then I'm fully prepared to engage with them. Uh, and as uh, <clears throat> uh, I think, was it Philip who said this, that we should uh, actually have uh, a face-to-face -face discussion to discuss. Right. A lot of it can be agreed in advance and then we can put that aside. Then we, the, the ones that 
are not agreed, we will have a discussion at the case management conference. Thank, thanks, Michael. Siku. Now, you know, in India, we, we used to at least have this impression that arbitrator was, uh, arbitration was something without procedure and without rules and everything should be ad hoc and, and very flexible. But I think you being engaged so much in international arbitration would realize that actually procedure and making it and making clear the procedure at the outset actually aids in the process. Uh, what are your views on, on procedure? And I'm going to then let you go straight into the next part uh, that we're going to discuss, which is COVID. How are you handling international arbitrations at the time of COVID? So I'm going to give you two questions in one. Thanks, Darius, for that. I think it's an interesting sort of mix because I'll give an example of what happened. <laughs> you have a... Um, now, first, let me tell you about the experience in Indian arbitrations, which have been going on for a long time. Procedural orders of the nature that we see in international arbitrations were just not there at all. I think I was probably one of the first to start introducing that when I got appointed in some domestic arbitration, mostly the international. And I have a template, and I must say that um, the first time I saw a real long procedural order was Michael's procedural order. Which I, I second all that. Kinds I of second details, that. Including, I the, that. <laughs> including the questions that can be asked in cross-examination. <laughs> so I did, in fact, use that template to make a much shorter template for myself. I must confess that to Michael here. Uh, but uh, of course, and modified it as you go along, uh, you know, various things have changed over time. And then, you know, you, you make your own experience, which, which, which sort of adapts to those procedural orders. So I've started introducing those uh, procedural orders in Indian arbitrations a few years ago. Now, uh, what I have seen recently is some tribunal, Indian, purely domestic Indian tribunals, have started having a procedural order, but it's never the kind that we look at in international arbitrations where you are setting the, you know, the timetable from day one to day, you know, till the closing submissions in a sense. At the maximum, many times you have to be discussed on the, on the you know, date of the written closing submissions after the hearing. Indian procedural orders are very sort of, uh, for the first time up to the issues, or you know, up to the next date of hearing kind of thing, these and this and that, when they're ad hoc arbitrations. Uh, and I do wish that more tribunals would start looking at arbitrations, not with hearings from day to day and, you know, having fixing um, two months away, three months away, and rather having one set of procedural order from day one to day end kind of thing, which would then have the calendars much, prop, you know, much better organized. And that's what I try to do here. Uh, and it... I think people have started accepting that in the Indian context also. And I, a lot of law firms now prefer that, that rather than having a number of hearings, which increases the cost to the, you know, to the parties a lot, uh, you stick to the five day, 10 day schedule, depending on how, how long the, or how big the matter is, um, including transcription services. For example, in India, we find that, and most arbitrators don't want transcription whatever reason, I'm talking purely of domestic, you know, arbitrators, they just don't want transcriptions. But I'm one who always pushes for transcription because then one of the things of transparency comes out, you can see exactly what happened in the proceeding, who's got full, you know, the opportunities that have been given to the parties, parties can't complain later about all that. Um, I, both for witness examination and for the final hearings, I think transcription is something which Indian arbitration should in, uh, sort of introduce in uh, as more or less mandatory procedure. An interesting question about COVID, let's go to the next step. We had a mat and everybody would have gone through that, all arbitrators in this panel would have gone through that, 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 um, that experience. You had a procedural order all set for hearing dates which have now fallen straight into the COVID chapter. I had ones, you know, where, where the hearing dates were fixed for end of April. Um, I was doing an arbitration in London in February, March, and I realized that that with what was happening, that's going to get get into a problem. So, thinking in advance, you had to look at what are the potential possibilities. Will that hearing in end of April in Singapore happen or not happen? Um, so we started discussing at that point of time, and there was one arbitrator from, from New York, one from Canada, and then myself. So we started discussing in advance and asked the parties for their comments as to if, 
or if this COVID issues go on and increase and travel all got st stopped and we can't have the hearings, what do you want to do? Do you want to do virtual hearings um, at that point of time or do you want a date adjustment? Initially, we found in all of these, at least my experience was that everybody wanted the dates to be pushed. Nobody wanted to go into straight into procedural hearings um, or straight into sort of final hearings by video conference and you know the Zoom platforms, et cetera. And it hadn't yet developed to that extent. So I think about for all the hearings in April and May got pushed to much later dates to hope that you know August, September, October, whatever dates the tribunals could find. Um, so it just got, you know, you just change the date of hearing and the dates of the opening skeletons in that sense. That, that those are the only changes made to the procedural hearing. But as time went by and you found that nothing is really changing and you're still stuck with this uh, situation where you can't travel, you can't have physical hearings. Um, we then started discussions about, you know, the, that the only way forward in order to comply with your duty as arbitrators to have an expeditious disposal. Uh, is to see whether parties would agree preferably that the trial takes place through uh, you know virtual means and we can ensure witness sort of um, integrity etc by nowadays having this 360 degrees cameras and things in the room etc luckily i think over time everybody has agreed to it and um, there, there were objections initially and you know mostly you find from respondents that they object to cross examination etc by by a video conference, but by now everybody is living up to it, and you have in most international—I don't know if any international arbitration now where people have actually refused, unless it's a very complex in cases of fraud, etc., or something like that, where you want the witnesses up front in front of you. So the procedural orders have changed to accommodate that, and the various sort of technical challenges that have to be met. The, the, each rule, each you know, that is the ICC rules, the CAC rules. They all require the technical sort of specification, you know, compliances. You have the civil you know, protocol for that. Uh, you, you know, now guidelines have been issued by all of the institutions on conducting virtual hearings, which have been adopted into the procedural orders going forward. Uh, even for hearings next year, you're having options like, you know, if it's physical or virtual, either way it will go on. If it's virtual, these are the you know the things that, that parties have to comply with. That's how and, we're dealing with. It. And don't you find CQ that actually having gone through virtual hearings, they produce as fair and efficient a result uh, as a, as a physical hearing, barring cases, some cases of examination or cross examination. I think uh, hearing just I mean just arguments is perfectly good. Is you know sometimes you do have a little problem of bandwidths and you know some but minor disturbances, but Overall, there's no, no real issue. Um, is it the same as a physical hearing? Personally, I think no, especially in, uh, when it comes to cross-examination and you know, witnesses, definitely not, but I think you still have to, where's the balance? And I think the balance isn't continuing with virtual as of now, at least. That's right, that's uh, right. But there is a difference in physical. And I must say that we did a physical hearing of a large matter for 13 days in Delhi during August, September. And, you know, we're doing virtual hearings on, the, uh, on different days on, during that period. And I did see the difference in the uptake of the tribunal and the, the, the attention span of the tribunal members. Mm -hmm. And there were three Supreme, retired Supreme Court judges who did consent to come to this physical venue. And um, there is a definite difference between the two, I think. I don't know. No, no there doubt is. there is. I think uh, focusing and concentration is something we all have to actually learn uh, in virtual hearings. It's, it's far more difficult to, have, to sit for longer stretches. So maybe breaking up sessions into sh shorter sessions might be one of the ways of handling it. But yes, of course, there's no substitute for a physical hearing. But as you rightly said, if the choice is physical hearing or no hearing, uh, the virtual hearing offers you as fair and efficient a procedure in that sense as a virtual hearing. Uh, so the, the so all systems go really as far as virtual hearings. Justice Sikri, what's your experience been? Would you impose a virtual hearing during COVID times on a party, even if a party objected? You see, uh, I tell you, you have to keep in mind the due process uh, clause. 
and uh, you have to see uh, in the particular case uh, uh, what are the circumstances and uh, if uh, uh, one of the parties is not agreeing to virtual hearing then can we impose it or not it would depend upon that and uh, having said so let me tell you from my experience it is almost the same as uh, uh, siku has said uh, initially uh, even those cases which were uh, at the stage of arguments whether it's an argument say on application for interim measures or it is uh, final uh, arguments etc after initial hiccups parties uh, and uh, as as you know the kind of environment it, when it was for uh, first one or two months uh, the cases were all pushed uh, beyond that and uh, uh, the uh, adjournments were given but then uh, they, uh, they they all started agreeing and i have not found a single case where if it is a case for arguments that any of the parties have resisted they have agreed for virtual hearing the difficulty comes when it's a matter of recording of the evidence the trial stage the cases which are at the trial stage in that case actually as far as domestic arbitration is concerned we were normally governed by if you remember in the beginning itself supreme court had issued the directions although those directions applied to the courts where the supreme court said that unless both the parties agree don't record the evidence it was a direction to the courts subordinate courts high court and other which have the original jurisdiction yes. and the subordinate courts but uh, the uh, um, uh, uh, important issue which arises out of this or an aspect which emerges is that uh, look tomorrow if the award is challenged on the ground of due process then anybody can argue when the supreme court said unless both the parties agree even the trial in the court cannot go on why it is uh, in the arbitration proceeding it was thrusted upon so therefore that was the view taken where one of the parties is objecting to uh, the uh, uh, in so far as trial is concerned and uh, they are saying no it has to be physical in person hearing and not on virtual we normally would not do so but then over a period of time uh, i mean uh, uh, say uh, having advantage of what like uh, ciac lcia or icc etc they uh, formulated fresh rules on uh, virtual hearing and recording of evidence also so on that basis as well as uh, like personally i all prepared a full protocol uh, if the evidence is to be recorded then what should be the uh, i mean the guidelines which should be followed in order to ensure that it is going to be very fair and on that basis we were able to persuade and many have agreed and the uh, evidence is going on as far as international arbitration is concerned let me tell you uh, actually the matter can be looked into from two angles uh, siku said that in those cases where the hearings were fixed in Ap april or so we started uh, <clears throat> uh, discussing about that matter well in advance that may that that is good if the matter is fixed for final hearings you can persuade the parties for virtual but then if uh, in the beginning in that like we were discussing about the procedural order first procedural order on the basis of template and <clears throat> the uh, in the international arbitration we have discussed the entire time schedule till the end but the stage is at the uh, we are at the stage of completion of the pleadings only so statement of claim or the statement of defense is yet to come and covid situation crops up in the in between and once that is affected like i in one ciac matter only i know where <clears throat> i am uh, a, a nominee arbitrator from india there are two other arbitrators from other jurisdiction even including the chair who is from australia so <clears throat> at one stage when the uh, respondent who is an indian party a big company was asking for time because they have their office in uh, mumbai and in mumbai in particularly in that may uh, from april to may june etc the situation was really very very bad and they asked for extension of time once or twice then once they were asking again then uh, the uh, uh, when three of us conferred the uh, uh, presiding ar arbitrator told me that look for how long we will give i had to tell them look the area where this office is located is really in a containment zone what they are saying is maybe they it is truth and ultimately if the award suppose it goes against them it has to be ultimately implemented or enforced in india 
and this is the position in india so therefore they this uh, uh, i mean we had to adjourn but then right. as it is right. rightly said we accommodated of course now it is back on track and the entire dates are fixed and we are going to go for trial very soon in that case also so these are some of the aspects of due process which covid has situation has uh, i mean uh, has, has shown up you are you are absolutely right judge in fact a very quick question on this topic to ben and then we'll move on and and philip if he wants to weigh in do you think that uh, virtual hearings have now come to stay permanently in international arbitration and uh, in some form or the other even after we pass the covid era uh i think in in some ways yes um i i think we would all agree that it, it if if possible it would be preferable to hold the hearings in person uh and when covid is over i think we're all going to be very eager to get on uh airplanes again and see live human beings and uh sit together uh and i think there are certain advantages to that but i think the fact that these hearings have worked so well i mean uh there was a lot of resistance but we were forced to to get on with it and we we learned how well this works uh and i i think that uh going forward uh it will not be reasonable or expected that we fly a witness all the way across the world for 2 hours of testimony I mean that I don't I just don't think that the parties will be willing to bear that expense anymore. I don't think the arbitrators will be ordering it. Uh I think we have learned how effective cross-examination uh can be on on this platform and um it you have to do a cost benefit analysis. Um sure there will be some parties who prefer that, but I think there will be a lot of parties who agree that we are going to do a lot of an awful lot of these um procedures uh by uh zoom or whatever platform to save time and money it simply doesn't make sense to fly people but you are absolutely right ben i think i think in many respects that technology will now be incorporated in mainstream arbitration uh, in the years to come a uh, philip any thoughts new, you know now new normal which is hybrid system Tom, exactly wherever, exactly. Where, wherever it is possible by virtual and uh, we can save cost and money that would be adopted and whenever it I is feasible here in the good system, point I international think. arbitration was getting very expensive and i think this is one of the ways in which we can use technology uh, and our familiarity now with that technology to reduce that cost a uh, philip any ideas uh sure i i i certainly agree that uh virtual hearings are here to stay uh, a proportion of hearings will continue to be done virtually uh in, and uh indeed that uh you, you, you we will see more frequent use of of video conferencing for for one particular aspect of a hearing such as if one witness is is uh, finds it difficult to travel to be much more acceptable i think for for that to be done by video than in the past I think what's interesting is I think we're 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 still at a stage where uh I'm sure there're going to be a lot of improvements in in technology uh in terms of how we are able to manage documents uh in the course of a virtual hearing for example and I think uh that will come uh as uh, as innovators put their minds to it so I actually think uh we might find in a few years time that virtual hearings are much better than physical hearings even that's good that's good to hear now i'm going to uh, cut short the discussion on procedure because we are running out of time uh, which is always a good sign of course uh, and get to the last topic which is which might be of interest to, again to the participants is how to handle differences between arbitrators uh michael starting with you if one of your co arbitrators uh has a very strong view and wants to dissent uh or worse if you feel one of your co arbitrators is acting in a way that is partial or biased towards a party do you feel yourself confined by the rules of confidentiality or or is there something that you could or would do in such situations dissents of course are, are completely legitimate but if you felt that he was biased right um so there's there's two let me be uh, practical i mean it's, it has never happened to me to that extent there are times when or there was one occasion in particular where uh the one one of the, the arbitrators uh was doing sorry taking what the two other arbitrators including myself 
uh, felt was not logical, not reasonable in the face of the evidence. Uh, and we had our suspicions, but uh, we could not uh, do anything. But the fact was that he was uh, demonstrating his partisanship in such a way that the two other arbitrators had come to at least a tentative view uh, that A, he was a partisan, B, he might even be um, communicating with his party. Now, we had no evidence of this, so we couldn't do anything. But just for everyone's information, uh, people forget that there is one uh, non-binding uh, ethical principle out there which could be invoked if really necessary. And that is the IBA Code of Ethics for arbitrators. Um, and I don't have the date of it, but it was in the late 90s, I think. And there was an exhaustive code published by the IBA, and it had something to deal with this particular situation. The IBA Code of Ethics was drastically re uh, revised in the sense that a whole bunch of uh, rules in that code was replaced by the IBA guidelines on conflicts of interest. So that became the focus of attention, but they never repealed the rest of the guidelines. And one of them, which is I think rule five, sub rule four, says something to this effect, that if uh, two arbitrators discover, discover meaning you have some assurance that is true, that the third arbitrator is in improper communication ex parte with one of the parties, then there's a sort of protocol. First, you address this uh, rogue arbitrator privately and said, this is not done. Will you undertake to stop doing this? And that's as far as you can go. If he does not agree or continues with this behavior, then you will be at liberty to lift confidentiality and report this. Uh, now, the, the code guideline says you can report this to the innocent party. But frankly, I think if you want to, you will have to do it openly. And then the, obviously the innocent party will take some action, but that is for the innocent party to initiate. So what that uh, code rule says uh, is that you blow the whistle and then you wait for the parties to take action, whether to go to court or make a formal application to the tribunal, whatever. And, and take it from there. I've never known it being invoked, but it's out there. That, 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 that's, a, that's very helpful because a lot, a lot of uh, counsel and participants wonder how, is there an inbuilt mechanism to prevent this sort of thing from happening? And that's reassuring to know that, yes, there are ways and means of ensuring that a tribunal acts within the bounds of, of fairness and law. Uh, Justice Sikri, do you find uh, any difference in the way you have to deal with co-arbitrators from the way you dealt with your co-judges when you sat on courts? No, till, uh, I tell you the problem, this of partiality or impartiality or bias may occur anywhere because it's an adjudication process, whether you are uh, in the arbitration in a panel or you are in a bench sitting uh, uh, in the court. There also such situation may occur and may crop up. Uh, fortunately, uh, I tell you, in my 20 years uh, of judgeship, uh, I never encountered such a problem. But having said so, let me be very frank, maybe we didn't come to know of any such problem, even if there was something and if some fellow judge was, uh, uh, so to say, if I use that strong word, misconducting himself or herself. So if it, it, it never came to our notice, so there was no question of uh, this. But uh, uh, I have seen otherwise when it comes to, as far as uh, the, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, a person sitting on the bench is concerned. And uh, uh, what I have observed otherwise, apart from my experience where it is found, I have seen some of the judges going up to the chief justice there because that is an easy mode as far as judi uh, a judicial uh, function is concerned. Going to the chief justice and then the chief justice would take care of uh, by changing the bench and removing that person. So that is an easy way. So which is normally, which have been, uh, I mean, this is one uh, sort of, uh, uh, I mean, mechanism which is adopted, which nobody comes to know on administrative side as a master of the roster, uh, chief justice does it. It may look to others 
as if uh, something is done in a routine, but inside uh, the reason was something else, and which was this. So that can be uh, that can happen. So therefore, there is an easy way out in so far as judicial uh, branch is concerned. Coming to but arbitration, I, yeah, sorry. sorry the master of our roster tells me we have one minute left. Our time's up, actually. So please complete your thought, just disagree. And okay. And but when it comes to arbitration, normally what happens is, uh, as was rightly said, uh, it's a very thin line. On the one hand, it's a there's a provision of confidentiality. But the, whatever is happening within us, it has to be. And like uh, uh, Rule 39 is also there in the uh, CAC rules. But having said so, what is uh, uh, told, uh, uh, I mean, uh, earlier uh, by Michael, it makes sense because that rule doesn't mean that uh, even if uh, there is some, uh, uh, as I would say, and I've used the word misconduct, so it amounts to misconduct. If one of the arbitrator is uh, uh, talking to a party, private party, ex-party communication, et cetera, or in any way. So if, if it uh, is breaching that, then it is better to tell, and I am also happy to note that there is a rule. And then, as he rightly said, you blow the whistle and then leave it to the party. So I, I, th thank you all very much. I'm afraid I'm going to have to blow the whistle now. Uh, uh -huh. This has been a very engaging discussion, and I, I think the participants will be reassured that there's so much thought and judgment that goes on behind the scenes in arbitration. Uh, that you are really secure that in 99% in or if not 100% of your cases, you're, you're before a very fair and experienced set of arbitrators. I think we've had a galaxy here and we're truly grateful to each of you for sharing uh, both anecdotal experiences as well as your wisdom. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to Shweta and the backup team as well. Thank you, Darius, for a wonderful job you have done. Thank you. Thank you, Darius. Thank you, Darius. And all I, the participants. I, 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 Thank you.